Well, what we're looking at this morning is a little bit broad, so uh, I don't have a text that's going to cover all the bases, so I'm just going to start with one. And I will refer to it a little bit later in, in the sermon. But here I think you'll see is, is clearly a passage referring to the, um, our Lord Jesus um, exercising the office of a prophet as he preaches in a synagogue in Nazareth, uh, showing the connection between what he's doing and what he said he would do through Isaiah many centuries before. So Luke 14, excuse me, Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 19. This is what Luke writes by the inspiration of the Spirit. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And as we know, the, uh, what happened after this was Jesus said today, this prophecy has been fulfilled in your hearing. And as they're wondering about this, uh, Jesus goes on and they realize that um, he was referring to himself and they got upset about it and tried to execute him. But uh, he walked you know, through the midst of them and went on his way. But the point is, this is what Jesus came to do, to proclaim God's truth as the prophet. And that is a part of his mediation. And that's what we want to think about. Mediation in general, what it means, and his prophetic office in particular. So, what I'd like to do, though, to begin is just review a bit of what we've been looking at, because I know these things can sift out of our minds. And each one of these points, I think, was, was important. So, um, let me just briefly bring us back up to date here. Now, we have seen so far that to love God we must be convinced that he really exists, that there is a God that we may love. Now, we've, if you've been here in the evenings, uh, James has told us how doubt can hinder our prayers. Even when we ask for something that God has promised to give us, if we don't believe that he will answer that, if we don't believe he's there to answer it, that he can answer it or that he will answer it, then we really can't expect it to receive anything. We need to understand that doubt can also hinder us here as well in our love for God. Because why would we love him as he calls us to? Remember, the Lord calls us to give everything for him, to give up our lives in this world in order to seek him, to worship him and to serve him with our whole heart. Why would we ever do that? if we're not convinced that God even exists, okay? We, we have to know that He is, okay? Secondly, we saw we need to be convinced that we have a reliable source of information about Him that te teaches us who He is, teaches us how to love Him. Uh, we need to believe the Bible is that source, that it is His communication to us, and that what it says is true, okay? We have to have that conviction, and then we began, of course, to delve into what that communication actually teaches us about God. We need to learn from it just how loving, just how gracious He really has been to us in giving to us common blessings, you know, making us, remember, our existence we owe to Him, making us like Him so that we might know Him. The only reason why we are rational creatures, okay, that we have the gifts that we have, is that we would have the potential to know God. That's why he gave these things to us. We need to understand that, that everything that we enjoy in this world, all the wonderful things that God has placed here and the abilities we have to enjoy them all come from us. And every single good thing we have ever received in this world, all the care, all the provision has all come from him. I think about what Paul says in Romans chapter 1, why God's judgment comes upon the world is because they know God, they see that He is, they do not give Him thanks for any of His good gifts, and that's why He judges them. We can't be guilty of the same thing. We need to acknowledge 
that God is the one who has given these things to us. We need to see that they are gifts of his grace and his mercy. But of course, we especially need to thank him for his redemptive love. Even though we had offended him by breaking his commandments and were under his just sentence of everlasting punishment in a fiery hell. We need to believe that's real as well and that we have been delivered from that while we were still his enemies, while we still hated him. He gave the one most precious to him, the one he loved the most, the one that was dearest to him, to go through the agony, the suffering of the cross and to die in our place, to free us from punishment and give us eternal life. And remember, eternal life is not just that life would go on forever, but to give us a relationship with him, to adopt us as his children, and to make a new world for us where we might live with him forever in that day that he will, uh, well, in that world that he will one day create. And then finally, we need to appreciate what we saw last week, and that is that what the Lord has done through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and this, this is the part that, you know, um, I think that uh, those who are not Calvinists have the greatest difficulty with. What God has done in sending his son and providing all these wonderful things, he has not done for everyone, but only for those whom he has foreloved and chosen in eternity. And we need to remember that everything Jesus did would have done us no good at all if he had not first loved us. We need to be thankful for that. We need to receive that love. We need to, you know, there's a certain sense in which we're singled out. We can't pat ourselves on the back because it wasn't because of us. It wasn't anything God saw in us as we saw. It was purely because he chose to do it. And we need to be very thankful that he has chosen us. Now, this morning, what I want us to do is consider another aspect of his love that gives us another reason to love him. Jesus' work of living and dying doesn't in and of itself bring us to heaven. Okay? There is a work that he needs to continue to do. What I mean is his earthly work was not the end of it. Okay? There is still a work that he continues to do and he is doing for us now again because he loves us. He is our mediator who continues to speak to us who continues to pray for us and continues to protect us. And he does a lot more than this, but I'm just going to start with that. And we're not going to look at all these things this morning until he brings us safely all the way to heaven. Now, these things are going on invisibly, behind the scenes, so to speak. We don't see Jesus sitting on the throne with our physical eyes, but we do know from Scripture that he is there and that he is doing these things. So what I want us to consider this morning is this, that Jesus is our mediator, and I want us to begin to look at what it is that he is doing for us to bring us safely to heaven. Now, first of all, Jesus is our mediator. Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, for there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Now here, I think you see something of what a mediator actually is. And, you know, it's really wrapped up in that word, mediator, isn't it? In, um, I have a couple of definitions from Greek lexicon, which is just the famous word, or excuse me, a, a, a fancy word for dictionary. First one from the Lunida Dictionary, we read this, a mediator is one who causes two parties to come to an agreement with the implication of guaranteeing the certainty of that arrangement. And then Freiburg says this, a mediator is one who works to remove disagreement. He's a go-between, a reconciler, one who provides a guarantee of fulfillment of contracted obligation. So to, to put it simply, a mediator is one who stands between two parties who are at odds with each other, and who does what is necessary to bring them back together, to reconcile them. And I think we're familiar with that. I mean, we have mediators, don't we, in our own culture? Uh, 
when two people can't agree, you know, there's been some kind of offense and there's a disagreement with two parties, they often go to arbitration. Somebody who stands between them and tries to work out a solution, to try to bring them back together. Well, when we sinned and made ourselves God's enemies, God gave us one who would stand between us and who would do what was necessary in order to reconcile us. Now, we've already talked about this when we were talking about the covenant of redemption, the covenant of grace, because in that eternal determination of God to send his son into the world, he doesn't just send his son to do this one particular work. It's, it's really a whole package. It's this whole mission. He sends Jesus as a mediator, as this go-between knowing that we would fall in Adam, knowing that we would fall away and become his enemies, and that we would be guilty enough to go into hell forever, not wanting us to perish, he was eternally determined to send this mediator to reconcile us, and that is the Lord Jesus. Now, if those who are to be reconciled were just merely two people, as we see in our own culture, that mediator could have just been a man, just merely a man. Uh, a man can reconcile two men. But because this mediator had a much larger job to do, he had to reconcile God and man. We understand that our mediator had to be much more than merely a man. Now, he couldn't have been less than a man. It is interesting in church history, there are debates. I don't know if you've heard this or not. It sounds somewhat ridiculous, but these things were actually debated. And the debate was whether Jesus as a mediator had to be a man or whether he could have been perhaps an animal, you know, maybe a donkey or something else like that, maybe a sacrificial animal of some kind. Uh, some believed that that was possible. I forget the name for that particular group, but they were obviously wrong. It wasn't possible, okay? Jesus had to be a man in order to bring about reconciliation because of the debt that was owed by us, okay? We owed the debt, and if there was to be reconciliation, we had to pay that debt. And in order for, for him to reconcile us, he had to become a man in order that he might pay it. Now again, if it were simply between two men, that might have been enough, but we know that the offense was much greater because committed against an infinitely worthy God, so he had to be much more than just a man. Remember the payment that we owe to God's justice, how great it was. The crimes that we had committed was against one who was infinitely holy and infinitely worthy. Our guilt was therefore infinite. What we deserve for our sins was suffering beyond measure, which is something obviously we, we can't do. And that's why hell goes on forever and ever, because no finite creature can ever suffer enough to satisfy God's justice for having offended him. You see, that is the just payment. Man could not do it. And since no mere man could suffer to that degree, if the payment was to be made, it had to be made by someone who was infinitely worthy. It had to be made by God himself. And so we know from Scripture, the Son of God willingly humbled himself, joined himself with our nature, without emptying himself of any of his godhood, any of his divinity, any of his attributes. He emptied himself, as, as Paul talks about, being in the form of God. He didn't regard equality with God, something to be grasped, but emptied himself. He didn't do it by giving up his divinity. He did it by joining himself with our nature. He became a man that he might in our place obey his father, love his father according to his perfect law of love, and then go to the cross and suffer for us to pay our debt on the cross. But again, even in doing that, he had to be God so that when he was lifted up on the cross and suffered, that his suffering would be enough to pay our debt, but he also had to be God in order to endure God's infinite wrath for us without being destroyed by it. 
we do need to remember that Christ's sufferings were not merely that, those of crucifixion. Okay, there were others who were crucified. There was nothing unusual about that. It was a horrible death. I mean, nobody would want to go through it. But that suffering in and of itself was not enough to atone for our crimes against God. Jesus had to suffer God's wrath on the cross. He suffered hell on the cross. His infinite wrath against our sins. And if Jesus had been merely a man, he would have been destroyed. His divine nature preserved him. Jonathan Edwards refers to it as Jesus offering up his, his human nature on the altar of his divine nature. Uh, and it's, it's really that which allows him to survive. But as I said before, okay, last week, this was only the first part of his work. This is only, and when we get to his priesthood, we'll, we'll just touch on that again. This is the work that justifies us if we are trusting him and for which you know, we should all already love him with our whole heart and give ourselves completely to him because it's this act that saves us. But as I've already mentioned, there was more that he had to do if he was going to bring us all the way to heaven. And as last week, by the way, we saw that he would. Remember that those whom he foreknew, he predestined become conformed to the image of his son. Those whom he predestined, he called. Those whom he called, he justified those whom he justified, he glorified. It is so certain to happen that it's referred to already in the past tense. But that doesn't mean there isn't a continuing work Jesus has to do in order to bring that about. And as I've already told you, that work can be summarized by his three offices, prophet, priest, and king. So in the few minutes we have remaining, let's just briefly consider the first, Jesus is our prophet. Now, remember that a prophet is somebody sent by God who is clothed with his authority in order to declare his message. We know about prophets from the Old Testament, you know, and we, we've seen some New Testament prophets as well, but we need to remember that Jesus is the prophet. He is the one that all the prophets were pointing to. He is the one that, that Moses said, the Lord's going to raise up one like me, and you will listen to him. I've already mentioned that he is the Logos, and the word Logos means the, the reason of God, the communication of God, the logic of God. We get the word logic from Logos. But he is the communication from God, the one who reveals him, um, the one who reveals his salvation, the one who reveals God's grace and his mercy, and as well as his justice. So in the Old Testament, when we see the Lord appearing and speaking, really, I think we should see that that is the Son of God exercising his prophetic role. Now think about this for a minute. Again, God could have provided salvation. He could have done all these things. But if he had never revealed what he was going to do in the Old Testament, if he didn't reveal what he had done in the New Testament, if there was still no provision for that revelation past those New Testament times, it wouldn't have done us any good because no one can be saved apart from hearing the gospel. You know, whenever I say things like that, I have to remember that there's always exceptions, aren't there? We do know that God saves through the gospel. You know, the gospel needs to be preached. Um, but there are exceptions. Elect infants die in an infancy. They may never hear the gospel. Those who don't have um, perhaps the ability to understand and maybe never did their entire lives, uh, those who are mentally challenged, there are still per those that God has chosen among them that he will bring to salvation. But everybody else, okay, everybody else, they have to hear the gospel. That's why he calls us to evangelize. That's why Paul says, how are they going to hear unless somebody is sent to preach the message? How are they going to hear Christ speaking in his prophetic office? But you see, that is Jesus' work, to declare God's salvation, even to declare himself in the Old Testament, New Testament, and throughout history. Now, this is something he did from the very beginning. When we think of Adam and Eve and their fall, and how they fell away from God, how when the Lord appears to them, and he tells them the, the first proclamation of the gospel, 
That is Christ exercising his prophetic office as he declares the curse on the serpent. You know, and we see actually both aspects of it. You know, when we think about the Spirit of God applying Christ, that's still Christ speaking with a voice that raises the dead. And in this case, when the Lord spoke what he did to Adam and Eve, he spoke with that voice. He raised them from the dead. They believed and they were saved. They trusted the Christ who was to come. I think that's clear. It's much more clear, I think, with regard to Eve because God says, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman. And you know, there's only two camps, right? There's the camp of Satan, there's the camp, God's camp. And if there's enmity between the woman and the serpent, that means that she's in the camp, God's camp, okay? And we see them worshiping the Lord, and we see them serving the Lord, uh, following this, you know, this, well, redemption, okay? So he spoke to them with a voice that raised them from the dead. They trusted in the Christ who was to come, the seed of the woman who had crushed the head of the serpent. And we know that's how Old Testament saints were saved. They were saved the same way we are, by trusting Christ. But what I want us to see is that Christ was preaching to them, even back in those days. We already read how Jesus spoke by his spirit through the prophets. As little by little, he revealed who he would be and what he would do as Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, verses 10 and 11. As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Jesus sent his angel, and we talk about it. Jesus technically refers to the man, Christ Jesus. So we might say the Son of God sent his angel, his messengers, to tell Zacharias that his wife would give birth to the forerunner of the Messiah. He sent his messenger to Mary to let her know that she would give birth to the Messiah. When Mary visited Elizabeth, he sent his spirit to cause them both to prophesy, telling them what John would do, telling them what Jesus would do. When he was born, he sent the angels to herald his birth. During his earthly ministry, he went about preaching the gospel, as we already read in our text, in fulfillment of Isaiah, the the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, okay? Before his ascension, Jesus commissioned his apostles to continue that work, even calling his most ardent enemy into his kingdom to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And that is, of course, Saul the Pharisee Saul, or the one who became the Apostle Paul. Now, remember, apart from Christ's faithfulness to this office as prophet, no one would have known a thing about the gospel. Jesus has been speaking throughout history. In the Old Testament, as we saw, in his earthly ministry, and he continues to speak. As a matter of fact, he's spoken to us, otherwise we would know nothing about him. And he continues to speak today. He speaks through his, through his word, okay? As we, as we read it in faith, and the Spirit of God reveals his glory in the word of God, that's Jesus speaking in his prophetic office. He speaks through his ministers as they read and explain and apply the word of God and administer the sacraments. You know, if you, if you study the sacraments, you know that they're a, a, a visible word, it's a visible sign, an expression of, of um, the invisible grace of God. It's a mute word that is explained by the Bible, but it's still a revelation of God's truth, and it's Jesus speaking to us through this. He speaks to us when we sing psalms and hymns. Remember how Paul says we ought to be uh, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs? That is also a revelation of Christ's truth to us. He's speaking to us, and we need to listen. 
And of course, we need to understand that Jesus also speaks through us as we share the gospel with others. And you know, the wonderful thing is he not only speaks outwardly when we share the gospel with others, but he also speaks inwardly when and where he chooses through the Spirit of God, through that inward call, raising the dead to life. Now, again, that's the reason why we go out. We, we go out and we share the gospel because the Lord calls us to do that. But the encouragement is that internal call is also going to be given when the Lord determines to call someone to salvation. Those are the lost sheep that we're to be out there looking for, and we find them by sharing the gospel. Now, Jesus not only tells us how to be reconciled to God through his prophetic office, but he also tells us how to love him, how to live in a way that pleases him, how to grow more into his image. Think about what Paul said to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, verse 32. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Christ speaks with a voice that changes us, that transforms us, that makes us more like Him. Now, as those who have experienced His love and His grace, there's really nothing that should be more important to us than to know how to love the Lord in return. You know, if God had not given His Son as our mediator, we could not be saved. But if he hadn't appointed him to declare that salvation to us, his death would have done us no good. We could have searched creation forever, general revelation. And by the way, Christ speaks through that as well, but not the gospel. That is only discovered in the word, okay? If he hadn't spoken to us, we never would have been saved. We never would have become more like him. And one thing we need to realize, too, is that Jesus, as prophet, gives to his people his word in a special way, in a way that not everybody receives, okay? It may be true that there are many people in the world who own a Bible. I was looking up some statistics. You know that 20 million copies of the Bible are sold every year? that over 115,000 are given away every day. It sounds like there's more given away than are sold, okay? It's estimated that there are 6 billion Bibles in print, and I realize that you know, there's more people than that, I believe, in the world now. Not everybody has one, and several families probably have more than one. So there's a lot of Bibles out there. But we need to realize that the Bible does not really belong to everyone. It's not given to the world. We should never read it that way. And that's the way most people read it. They open it up and when Paul says something to the church, to the redeemed, they say, well, that applies to the world. But it doesn't apply to the world. It applies to those who belong to him. The Bible, the word of God, what Jesus has spoken really belongs only to those who have heard his voice and have responded to his gospel. In other words, Jesus speaks, but he speaks to his people, and he has spoken to us, and it is is our particular treasure that he has given to us. And so the point is this, if we have heard Jesus' voice, if we have responded in faith and repentance, which means that we have heard it, we love him, and we're following him, then we're blessed because what Jesus has done He has done for us what he has spoken. He has spoken to us. And how much then should we love him for that mercy? Now, again, these are things that we're used to hearing, and I hope we can see them in a slightly different light. The prophetic office of Christ is given that he might speak to us, and he is speaking to us, and we need to listen, and we need to do what it is he calls us to do. Now, the prophetic office is his speaking. We're going to look at his kingship next week um, along with his priesthood and uh, consider that as our king, there are certain things he also calls us to do and uh, that through his prophetic role as well. Well, let's uh, let's bow for a moment of, of prayer and let's
not only thank the Lord that he has given to us a great high prophet, or a great, excuse me, a great prophet, but also uh, let's ask him to prepare us to hear what it is he's going to say to us as we come to the table this morning. Okay, let's, uh, let's spend a few moments in prayer.